just kind of a brief overview. Um, so I'm going to go, you know, I want to give some background, um, kind of what MD, where it came from, um, some of the key players. I'll talk about some of the kind of the key steps in it. What are the, um, and there, there's some math challenges and interesting research going on in, in each of them along the way uh, that are actually underneath the simulation. I think the best way to understand this is to kind of give examples. I'll have a few, a few examples, but I'll spend time on, on some work and kind of the, how we made some of those choices and um, uh, as far as what methods and uh, challenges that arose for an example. Um, and that, that leads to kind of three, what I call three challenges, um, a length scale challenge, time scale, and accuracy. Um, so Danny will talk about in, in lecture two, the time scale one. So I'll talk more about length scale and accuracy, which for MD really comes down to the potential that you're using the force field. Um, and then I'll just briefly wrap up at the end. So to start off, um, first of all, happy Pi Day to those who celebrate. Um, since we're in LA and, and the Academy Awards were Sunday, I'm going to sprinkle some movie uh, references throughout the talk. Um, so the brief history of MD, you know, I'll, I'll give kind of a, a kind of, it's, it's intimately related with, with Monte Carlo simulation um, that originated at Los Alamos. Um, Livermore then, Aldrin Wainwright, um, really the pioneers of, of molecular dynamics, but then there were others um, who, who took off after that, and, and now we're up to, you know, pretty journal covers and, and website um, homepages that you can't even tell there were atoms underneath there. There's there so many atoms you can't see them anymore. Um, so I mentioned I, I would have some movie references. This is kind of an oddball one. You, you might wonder why I'm showing a Woody Allen movie. Uh, this was 30 years ago. Uh, Woody Allen and Judy Davis were Academy Award nominees. Uh, neither, neither of them won. Uh, it had great supporting cast, uh, Liam Neeson, Sidney Pollack. But then at the end, when the credits roll and they, and they list the actors in order of appearance, the first one listed is one that you might be a bit surprised to see. Um, so Nick, Nick Metropolis, you know, stepping out of range and playing a scientist, uh, was actually in uh, the very beginning of the film. So you only have to sit through the first couple minutes to see, to see him. Um, of course, before that, before his, his film career, he was uh, at Los Alamos and University of Chicago, uh, known for Metropolis Monte Carlo. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the, the pioneering paper. The work had been done several years earlier, but uh, uh, this paper describing the use of Mon the Monte Carlo method to uh, compute equations of state uh, was kind of the landmark one. He was also involved in um, what was kind of one of the first co-design efforts, uh, designing a, a computer, the Maniac, to actually do these calculations. So along the way, you know, this led to actually, I think they got sick and tired of, of plugging in cables and, and wiring the computer for, for new um, applications, so they developed a kind of their own programming language and stuff. Um, so here he is, you know, with the, the hardware architect who, who didn't receive as much credit um, in the back. They were really the key players behind the Maniac. Um, as Danny and Ping and others from Los Alamos can attest, they don't let um, uh, theory division people in the computer rooms anymore, and it, it may be because uh, because he, he was in there, you know, smoking a cigarette uh, with with an ashtray on the table there. So um, that that is that is verboten now. Um, okay, so from Monte Carlo to MD. So so this you know as I mentioned, this first paper is computing the equation of state. And then the realization was, well, you don't need to move, move the atoms around or molecules around randomly. You can actually have, actually have them follow trajectories and, do th and you know, sample the, the phase space a different way. Um, so that's essentially what molecular dynamics is. And this is the, the landmark paper from that. Um, you know, it talks about um, accuracy issues, um, you know, the, the precision of the calculation, um, several hundred particles. Uh, they spelled computers differently back then. Um, in this case, the potentials, they were hard sphere interactions uh, like the Monte Carlo uh, ones. And then the analysis was, again, to compute uh, equilibrium properties in, in the equation of state. So, um, oops. So this one, um, you know, came out in 1957, um, Aldrin Wainwright. Uh, Marianne Mansing actually it wrote most of the programs, did most of the calculations and analysis. Here is showing the, uh, some of the images of, the, these are, you can't see them, but, but 2D hard disks uh, melting. Um, so she did a lot of work, uh, but you know, at that time, it's, it's kind of like um, lab technicians or, or people in the machine shop who 
really make the experiments work, but, but weren't credited on the paper. So, uh, but, but, but she was a key part of the team um, then. So, it, yeah. So you move on, since you mentioned. So um, I'm teaching this Metropolis Monte Carlo hours, but the, 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 the fact is Metropolis Monte Carlo was not invented by Metropolis, the, by Ariana Rosenbrooks. <laughs> So I that, just wanted to mention. Yeah, that, that's, um, and, and actually if, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, th these were all kind of, there were a lot of common thoughts floating around and who actually got credit for these it is, yeah, but, um, isn't as clear as it, as it uh, should be. Um, let's see, so, so I mentioned the, you know, that this kind of evolved from, from Monte Carlo and you mentioned uh, Metropolis of Monte Carlo. So, so when this paper came out, um, actually the accompanying article on the, the preceding page was a, uh, um, a Los Alamos Monte Carlo simulation. Um, at the end of the, this abstract, or abstract they, or first paragraph, they mentioned that uh, there's some differences between the first MD simulation and the Monte Carlo results. What this, you know, obviously short paper was, essentially showed that the, those previous Monte Carlo simulations, um, they weren't converged in, in, in um, number of steps or time scale. Um, so they actually showed, you know, by using even fewer particles uh, than the couple hundred particles that were done in the, the previous work, but going to longer, t longer time scales and sampling better, they could converge the calculations. And when they did that, they agreed with the first MD simulation. So actually, it, it was it's good to have competing methods and kind of drive each other and, um, you know, force Monte Carlo to improve. Okay, so those were all for, for hard spheres. Um, others, you know, adopted this, uh, mostly at other national labs like Brookhaven and Argonne. Um, wanted to model real systems compared to experiments. Um, so continuous potentials um, were introduced to model things like radiation damage, um, in this case, and I believe it's copper, um, and, uh, and liquid argon. Uh, so, so the work of Raman and, and folks at, at Argonne was really modeling argon, uh, was, you know, were computing properties that they could then compare to experimental measurements. Uh, the radiation damage work at, at Brookhaven, um, actually this image from the paper was the previous year already put on a journal cover, which was, I'm pretty sure is the first molecular dynamics simulation to be on a journal cover. And in 1959, probably one of the first journals to have an image on the cover, um, I, I, I would think. So, um, also, Los Alamos, um, you know, although it was the home of Monte Carlo, th there was, uh, of course, adoption of, of molecular dynamics. Uh, it was a nice Scientific American article published about um, how the stretch supercomputer shown here. This was an IBM machine. This is just the arithmetic unit. Um, there's, you know, the operator here, the guy way down there with the oscilloscope. And all this was to model a uh, three particle uh, system, um, classical MD. Um, the nice thing about modeling three particles is that visualization is easy. So here they just show the different bond links over time, and then eventually this, you know, this bond breaks. Um, from, from this article, I, I like the, the sentence in here. that they, they point out very early on that, that computational experiments are an entertaining method. Um, so they recognize the entertainment value um, and, uh, of, of these simulations. Uh, but, th but they do, you know, kind of, you know, point out that you know, already back then it was obvious that, you know, that they may eventually equal experiments in importance. Um, okay, so jumping ahead a few decades, you know, going from, from three particles, computers got big, well, they probably didn't get bigger in size, but they got more powerful. Uh, so jumping ahead, you know, a few decades, um, uh, burning in the 60s, you know, some of the original pioneering work was looking at hydrodynamic properties um, through these early MD simulations. Um, you know, he was still very active in the early 2000s and, and you know, once billion atom simulations had arrived, he, he was really excited about doing uh, modeling fluid instabilities and looking at things like the Rayleigh Taylor instability from an atomistic perspective. Oops. Um, and, and he actually, you know, this nanohydrodynamics term was one he, he was very proud of coining. Uh, and, you know, typically, Rayleigh Taylor, something modeled um, with continuum hydrodynamic simulations. Um, if you do that and start with a, a um, you know, set up a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid with a perfectly flat interface, um, the hydro simulation will happily let it sit there. Um, so, you know, at that scale, you would need to introduce some sort of 
initial perturbations. Whereas in experiments and atomistic simulations, just thermal fluctuations naturally uh, lead to some um, um, in nucleation of the instability. And that has the advantage of you don't need to introduce a, a perturbation wavelength, um, which, which you know, is an artifact that the hydrodynamic simulations have. That length scale would emerge naturally. And uh, when compared with experiments, you know, if you scale everything properly, um, they match much better, both in terms of that length scale that emerges as well as the uh, things like droplet breakup and other things that just aren't modeled very well at um, continu continuum scales. Um, let me see. So I mentioned, you know, billion atom simulations are something that, you know, are pretty much routine now. Um, so something like Rayleigh's hair, this is actually not directly MD, it's DSMC, which is slightly different, but, you know, several billion particles modeling, going for Nanosecond time scales. Uh, Livermore is always very kind to us in giving us um, uh, the machine access on holidays. Um, so, so Christmas and New Year's uh, this year was. They also seem to know when my birthday and my wife's birthday and our anniversary is. It's it's very, it's very amazing. Um, so, so with these, you know, and not because of, of these simulations in particular, but um, uh, you know, Bernie was recognized later with the uh, National Medal of Science. Um, I think at about about this time in 2009, I got you know one of those emails from ResearchGate or something, and it, it had asked me um, this question. I think I laughed too hard to ever actually endorse him, but um, it, it, it obviously was. Uh, so Bernie, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. But before that, uh, there was a two-day 90th birthday symposium out Livermore. Uh, Marianne uh, was there. She came back. Um, Tom Wiener had also died. Uh, Vasily Bulatov, who will be here in a couple weeks, uh, was there. Um, uh, former Livermore lab director, uh, a photo bummer in the back. So, you know, it was a good two-day celebration. Uh, David Sepperly and all the Bernie's old colleagues uh, uh, came back and uh, reminisced. Okay, so that's it for the history, just kind of the background. Um, what are... I mentioned the key, the key steps, and, and this is something where if I, if I was prepared to do actually a Blackboard talk, I, I would actually be able to go through and, and explain these in a bit more. This is going to be more um, given by examples. Uh, so, um, you know, for each of these steps, there's much more depth than I could possibly go into. So I'll just kind of go through what the, the key steps are the first and, and by far the most important. Um, Aiden has some very nice images of the, uh, the elements that go in and how they uh, go into the meat grinder that, that then make the, uh, the simulation. But the, the, the main one that will you know, poison your, your food is, is the interatomic potentials that go in and how you're actually modeling the interactions between atoms. So you know, back in the old days when you're doing hard spheres or something, that's clearly a model system. Um, Leonard Jones, um, you know, I'll talk more about potentials later, but you know, simple and like potentials like that are also, you know, they may be so-so for argon and some other uh, rare gases. Um, but, you know, even then are mostly a, a, a model system. But trying to model actual materials, uh, you know, going down through the periodic table leads pretty quickly into, into um, dangerous um, conditions. And whether the potential um, that that you want to use is, you know, has been developed or calibrated for the conditions that you want to use it at or is a risky condition, especially when you start exploring um, um, extreme, extreme conditions. Um, okay, so the potential, then you need to set up the simulation in some manner. You need to have the system. If you're modeling a crystal, you, you know the crystal structures, but if you're modeling a real material with defects and, and, and grains, it gets more complicated. Um, you need to um, started off at, at some reasonable condition um, as far as, you know, thermalized and equilibrated uh, b before you let things run. And then when you let things run, exactly what conditions you want to do it at, whether it's constant energy and, and um, you just assume the system is, is isolated or it's, it, it has some surrounding environment that, that keeps things, that, that controls the temperature or the pressure, and, and then you introduce... Um, there, there's a zoo of thermostats and barostats and other other um, um, kind of methods for for, for keeping that uh, for, for for sampling that ensemble, and those are related to to boundary conditions, especially when you start looking at, at um, 
driving the system in different ways. Um, so Los Alamos, we do a lot with shock waves and, and high velocity impacts. Um, and I'll give some examples of that. Um, so those first ones are just for doing the MD simulation, but then actually understanding it and getting information out is just as important. Um, so uh, both analysis and visualization can be useful. Um, how they are done, um, their, their own challenges there is, is how you actually you know, gain insight into things that are going on in a, in a large dynamic simulation. Um, so of these all, um, you know, just running the calculation, the, the, the vast majority of the computational effort is, is computing the forces. Um, everything else, integrating equations of motion, um, applying thermostats or barostats, and boundary conditions, those are all in the noise. It's really the, um, the, um, the, that force calculation. But, and especially, you know, as you scale things up and to, ex to soon exascale machines, um, preparing those initial samples, um, in, in some cases, takes as much time as, as actually then running a shockwave through it. It can take a long time to actually equilibrate a, a polycrystalline sample um, uh, before you, before you, uh, you know, hit it. Um, and then IO, um, trying to write out billions of atoms uh, every, you know, thousand or couple thousand time steps and then read them in and do analysis after the fact uh, can also be, be a large factor. So there's, there's also um, a lot of room for improvement there. Okay, so, yeah. So we talked before about the, the limitation of the hydrodynamic and the bank scale. Yeah. Do we have similar limits because of the choice of the time step in MD? And so I always tend to wonder, if, like, if I would do the same simulation, let's say a short wave, with a larger time step, how much would my result change? And obviously, I mainly rely on the, the recommended, recommended values, but maybe you can comment on this. Usually... MD is pretty good in that it'll just uh, fail. It'll, you know, atoms will, they'll come too close and they'll, you know, shoot off and, and you'll lose an atom if, if you try and use too large of a time step. And below that, you, you tend not to see a lot of um, kind of differences. I mean, if, if, if you want to get the exact trajectory, um, like if you're doing NV and you want to exactly conserve energy, you, you can, yeah, you, you, you can crank down the time step. But for a lot of the things, um, uh, it's pretty forgiving. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, uh, so, you know, this is just kind of obvious, but, but you know, we're, we're, you know, we have a system of, of you know, N atoms or particles, you know, with masses, or, and we're just integrating the, the equations of motion for those. Um, so, you know, F equals MA, uh, we have some, Potential function that depends on the positions of all the atoms, um, and then the derivative of that, which with respect to each atom, is, is you, you know, move each atom give, gives the force on that atom. Um, in practice, for metals or short range or um, um, covalent materials, there's a kind of a short sightedness principle, and, and atoms really only feel their neighbors within some immediate region. So this is often approximated, this, you know, in principle, many body potential function is often approximated by some short range um, interactions o over neighbors. Um, let's see, you know, th there are various, uh, this is one of the things I'm not going to go into, the, the, the various types of um, time stepping algorithms and um, uh, predictor corrector methods and all, all the more sophisticated ones for a lot of the MD that we do, just, just very simple ones, are suffice. Um, not sure why I mentioned temperature here. Um, you know, I mentioned the initial conditions. So, you know, common thing these days is to model nanocrystalline materials. Um, big interest in that. Um, so, you know, the Voronoi construction is the most popular method. You just pick, uh, you know, some number of, of, of random grain center locations and orientations, uh, and then fill up space around those going out to uh, the... Uh, you know, for every point in space, whichever grain center is closest, you fill it up with that orientation. Uh, that obviously leads to some very unphysical um, boundaries between those regions. So there's some black art there to try and avoid having very high energy grain boundaries by going in and, and deleting atoms that may be too high of an energy. Um, 
And then as long as you, this is one of the things I mentioned, as long as you can afford to kind of quench and, and um, there are various kind of cycling, you know, you can, you can gradually squeeze and relax and heat it up and cool it and various methods for trying to get it something closer to a, an actual um, nanocrystalline structure. Um, but if you take a picture of Voronoi sample, you can kind of tell it's, it's, it's created by this Voronoi algorithm um, as compared to experimental uh, micrographs of, of real polycrystal materials. So th there have been efforts to kind of produce initial conditions by other means. Um, one is centering, where you just start with a number of particles and um, use a, a contact dynamics algorithms to, to put them together and, and then center them. Similarly is, is a compaction method for like um, granular explosives in particular. Um, you know, quenching from the melt is probably the most realistic. Uh, so so um, work here. In, in this case, it's it's actually applying a um, not a uniform temperature, but a directional temperature field uh, that, that kind of represents what's additive, some actual um, additive manufacturing methods. So it generates a very different microstructure. Um, but again, these are all almost, you know, by the time you've done this, the actual running a shockwave through it is, is pretty fast. Um, let's see, there are other methods I won't really go into, um, but Again, trying to get beyond Voronoi and go towards more realistic uh, three microstructures that, that can be measured today um, uh, in place of the, this artificial approach. Okay, so that's initial conditions. See, I won't really say much about ensemble, um, you know, microcanonical, canonical, the constant temperature. Um, this, there are a number of different methods, um, e either deterministic or stochastic like Langevin where you introduce a random noise term. Um, there are pros and cons of all those methods. That could be a, a talk in itself that I'm definitely not going to go into. Um, and then various kinds of pressure methods if, again, if there are external boundary, uh, an external environment that, that, that keeps, keeps out there. Um, and, and they're very similar, just maintaining constant um, uh, uh, pressure and, and strains on the sample instead of um, instead of temperature. Okay, so I mentioned it might be easier with with some examples. Uh, so this one, oops, let's see how I start that. Okay, so one of the problems we wanted to model was was friction. So um, you know. Two materials slide over each other. What's that resistance to the um, to, to that sliding? Um, how does it arise, and how does it um, change that mic the microstructure? So here, um, you know, these are the atoms. Um, I'll explain later. Color by orientation, as you see, the grains kind of slip over. There are defects, dislocations within each of these grains that are rattling around and, and twins. This is the temperature profile. Um, so. You know, a few things here. We, we in this case, you know, I'm showing this because the, the the boundary conditions and the ensemble are there are different zones in the material. So in the interior here, you know, we don't want to introduce any artifacts. So it's constant energy, um, um, constant volume. In this case, this is a periodic sample. On the edges, though, we want to have a constant velocity. You can see there's these nicely sliding along here, and also have a thermostat to kind of let energy or, or let temperature um, be sucked out of the system as, as it's generated this interface. So in you know, these reservoir regions, they're imposed to have a constant center of mass velocity um, you know, to the left or to the right, and then a, a constant overall temperature as well. So uh, that's why these, these temperatures are pinned at the uh, top and bottom of this. Now, one thing you can see, y'all, this, this was a, um, a few hundred million atoms, it was you know, one of the top 10 machines and supercomputers in the world at the time. Um, the grains here have merged and you know, we're getting finite size effects because of this and so we can't really trust um, that you know, there aren't artifacts because of, because of the, this, these periodic boundaries and that's, that size that I mentioned. So you know, continuing the movie theme, that leads us to, you know, we, we, we need to do, we need bigger simulations to do that. And, um, you know, fortunately, I mentioned, if you wait, computers get you faster, you, you can do that. So um, again, at Livermore, a Sequoia um, 
was number one at the time. We could do larger systems. Um, actually, it did turn around that the, we, we, we could demonstrate that these were converged and got rid of the fi finite size effects at these, these larger scales and, and going out to longer time scales. Um, and so, you know, the, the goal, the journal cover, um, um, that comes out of that. So, let's see, some, so, you know, I wanted to use this to kind of illustrate some of the details. I already mentioned the issue of, of the Voronoi construction. Um, there are open source codes out there to do this, um, but one issue is that they're all serial, and so um, you, you can generate polycrystals of a million atoms or you know, a few tens of millions of atoms, but it's, it's, they're limited by the, the memory that you have on that, uh, on that node. You really need a, a parallel algorithm to, uh, to distribute that and generate larger samples. Um, so we essentially rewrote the, the algorithm in a parallel MD code um, that I'll mention in a minute. Um, similarly, for analysis and visualization, the, just the time to dump out data, read it in, and, and then you need a, a, a cluster or supercomputer just to do the analysis and visualization on. So that, and plus, when you're on early machines, uh, you know, bleeding edge supercomputers, the file systems often aren't um, aren't there or aren't reliable. So. That combination forced us to really do as much of the analysis and visual, visualization within the, the molecular dynamic simulation itself. And so um, there are some challenges there. You know, one, one common trick is you're running these simulations at some temperature, and, and how do you actually map that, that temperature or, or that configuration that with, with the thermal noise in it to a crystal structure? It can be, it can be difficult. So, um, you know, something that was done for, for what I showed are, are to kind of, as you go along, you know, periodically, whenever you, you know, every thousand or few thousand time steps when, when you want to do analysis, um, save, kind of keep in, in memory a copy of, of the, the atom positions of velocities. Uh, do a short quench um, to get rid of that thermal noise. Um, it can be very short. And then compute, you know, do your analysis with, with whatever approach. So, you know, for, for the ones I showed, it's we're using a simple centrosymmetry um, order parameter to determine the crystal phase, whether it's, we knew it was going to be FCC or BCC or HCP. Um, and then anything else is, is, is a defect. Um, if it is FCC, you know, aluminum's an FCC material, then you can, you can compare that from that local crystal orientation, you can map that to, uh, to the color map and, and then render those in, into pictures. And again, that is, you know, if you can do that in situ, it, it saves a lot of effort, but um, it's not always possible. And, and then once that's done, go back and, and restore the, 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 the save state and, and continue on the simulation on the way. Yeah. So for the question, how, how close can you get to uh, experimentally relevant uh, time scales? For, for experiments, Los Alamos is done. For, yeah, uh, it's, it, um, I, I think these got down to ten, uh, between one and 10 meters per second. Um, whereas a lot of, uh, some of the friction experiments Los Alamos have done, uh, or they have a rotating gun barrel and, and you know, you, you get a, a cylinder spinning and then impact it into a, uh, into a plate and then measure that frictional resistance of, so there's some very odd conditions that Los Alamos is interested in. And do you know how well do you match like friction values <clears> or <throat> the temperature? Like I imagine it will go very quickly, like that. the temperature is going to rise very quickly. They, um, so measuring temperature experimentally dynamically is a big challenge, um, especially at those time scales. One thing that has been compared to for those simulations that I showed are Kind of when you pick up the sample after the fact and look at that microstructure and how that kind of gives a you know an impact of the temperature history, um, that qualitatively compares. I don't think there's been a quantitative comparison because there are different conditions, different materials. Uh, um, there, yeah, for, for, and, and for the frictional force, the, the resistance, those have been compared and those those actually agree pretty well um, at those conditions though. They're very high velocity. So, how did you handle cases where atoms would leave their original 
tasks, CPU tasks. You know, if, if each one's in a grain, but you have some frictional force where an atom would maybe migrate into its neighbor grain, does that does that happen? And if so, did, did you have to like load balance every time that happened, or just allow them to sort of diffuse away and, and have more and more neighbor information? Um. Sort of. I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit in a few slides about the, the, the decomposition. Um, but I think one thing is that, that well, I'll, I'll leave it for there and, and then ask again. Okay. Um, okay, so for these, if we were doing this now, this, this simulation today, we would probably just, a lot of these methods um, are in something like Oviedo. Um, Alex Tukowski will be here later. Um, it includes the common neighbor analysis and some, some even better methods um, for comparing uh, structural templates and then actually analyzing dislocations um, and extracting that information out of simulations, at least for the, the you know, simple metals like, um, like this. Um, you know, this is just an example. So CNA, um, this I'm pretty sure is probably at a, a, a um, higher temperature, um, so it, it's a little noisier than usual, but um, but doing that and then actually extracting out what the dislocations are out of that jumble uh, g gives a much much cleaner um, pictures and insight into into how those dislocations are, are reacting and, and interacting, and, and that was actually this uh, Nature Cover article by uh, Vasily and folks. Um, you know, this is actually an analysis of a molecular dynamic simulation just showing the dislocations. Um, and, and the, as I mentioned, they, they follow the reactions as, as the simulation proceeds. Um, okay. So, let's see. I, I, one other example, again, high velocity um, shock, shock compression. So, um, Maybe a decade ago, uh, there was a lot of interest in, in starting to study uh, tantalum and, and its, its um, response and, and to be able to understand how it, when you compress it with a shock wave, um, you know, hit it at high velocity, kilometer per second, um, a compression wave runs through the sample. Um, when it reaches the free surface, a, a release wave, it, the sample goes back to zero pressure. Um, if you do that, um, if you impact one sample into another, you get release waves from both ends that then when they cross, the material is pulled into tension and it can, um, it can fail. And so those are the, the fracture surfaces you, you see here. Um, so with this, there are various issues as far as potential, um, the how we actually set up the, the conditions. And um, um, you know, I mentioned the three different challenges. Uh, you know, today, a decade later, um, I'll start with the potential. Today, we'd probably just, or the people paying us would want us to, to use a uh, machine learning based potential, but um, for various reasons, when, when, we, when we started this, um, you know, I mentioned when the, ideally someone has already developed a potential that describes the material of interest. So we went on it and we knew that we wanted to um, be able to model the, the response of tantalum under compression to you know, tens of, of gigapascals. So we just looked at the energy difference between um, the BCC ground state and, and um, HCP um, through this pressure range and found that all of the potentials in the literature, these are all um, embedded atom method or, or relatives, um, they all predicted that tantalum would be HCP after um, 35 to 65 GPA. Uh, whereas experimentally, it's, it's not. It remains BCC up to much higher pressures. So, um, that was a challenge. It, it meant that, you know, instead of just doing the simulation off the shelf, we had to first go develop our own, own potential to describe that, that interaction, um, one where it, at least it remained BCC um, up to much higher pressures. Uh, so there were a couple of variants of that potential here. And doing that by actually doing DFT calculations under different conditions, so uniaxial strain, compression, um, the energy, um, in different directions, um, a uniform 3D compression of the sample, uh, where there we could compare it to uh, some experiments um, for the, the pressure volume curve. Looking at defects by sliding um, um, uh, the interior crystal across itself, and again comparing DFT points uh, here to the EAM potential that we fit. Uh, you know, it's in some cases a little bit off, but generally pretty good and, and much, much better than.
anything else. So, so this is a trade-off between a fairly cheap potential like EAM and um, have, having you know, sufficient accuracy that you at least think qualitatively the, the behavior is correct. Okay, so the, the driving conditions, there are different ways to do that. Um, you know, the, the simplest one is just to directly model what the experiment is and send a flyer plate at some velocity into the target. Um, and, and so that you're not, don't have a moving reference frame, uh, you, you kind of do this symmetrically. Um, and these dashed lines are then those, those, when those release waves come together where the material is pulled into tension. Um, or you can just impose a velocity on one, one side of the, the, the sample. Um, the advantage of that is you, you can put in different velocity profiles and, and model different drive conditions, um, such as a laser that's a very short compression wave, uh, or high explosive, which is a more gradual but longer uh, time one. Um, all these, you do this, the overall simulation cost um, to do longer time scales means that you need a longer sample to run that wave through. So um, it, it grows, uh, this is the, the, the strain rate, um, it, epsilon dot, so the inverse of that is kind of the time scale. Um, the cost grows by the square of that, um, so you're very uh, somewhat limited there. Um, because of that, the the, the range of strain rates that the sim, sim, MD simulations could, could access by these methods is fairly limited. Uh, it's, it's over the, this range. Experiments, including laser ones, were mostly down, down here at this lower one. Um, you can you know, sort of draw a line through and imagine that this is, this is consistent, but it's not that satisfying. So another method where, you know, if you assume that the, the waves going through the material itself aren't critical, you can just model the sample um, kind of homogeneously and, and compress it at some imposed strain rate to create the, the shock damage, and then pull it into, into tension at some other strain rate to look at how the material fails. And then you can control these strain rates much better. You don't have to worry about waves going through. And now the, the computational cost is just directly proportional to the time that you want to, to follow. Um, and you're not introducing that link scale effect as well. So we do that, and then you can you know, look over a much wider range of, of strain rates, the, these, these boxes here. Um, you know, get down to, ex to experiment, and then up to the, uh, the theoretical um, failure limit. I mean, these are ridiculously short time scales. Um, but you do actually see that the theoretical strength is approached. Um, there are different mechanisms. So this is again using this is using the DXA algorithm in uh, Oviedo, um, showing is dislocations here and twins here. Let's get that um, and then comparing to some you know broader set of experiments where experiments are these field symbols. There's some laser neural laser experiments up at these very high strain rates, and then open symbols the MD simulations. And, and there I think there's a pretty good agreement and, and some overlap. There's obviously um, you know, we should have error bars on the, the simulations as well, but there, there's a huge um, kind of uncertainty at these, in many of these experiments and simulations. Um, so I mentioned this approach of, of kind of modeling homogeneous, uh, a uniform system, and this has been, this has been done for, for the particular case of shock, um, the shock response of materials by introducing things that are like, very much like thermostats or barostats, but instead control the um, um, kind of the combination of, of temperature and, and pressure that, that, that the um, conservation laws give for how materials respond to shocks. And then, then just by imposing instead of a temperature or pressure, the, the final shock pressure or strain or, or piston velocity, uh, there are these various what are called hugoniostats um, combined uh, thermostats and barostats for um, um, for modeling, um, for reaching shock states. And these again have the advantage of not having both the time scale and link scale pen penalty um, in the simulation. Okay, so that was a long winded way of getting towards um, kind of these, these three competing requirements that we have that hopefully I explained for this, for the Tantalum case. And there's a trade off, you know, if we have a co finite computational budget. And this is not just MD, it's, it's any simulation 
method. There, there's a trade-off between the length scale that you can access, the time scale, and accuracy. And these may be, um, you know, may, may not all be the same, may have different scaling, different dimensions for um, how different methods scale with, uh, say, the number of atoms. Um, so of these, um, uh, weak scaling, I mentioned the length scale challenge is, is, is pretty much the easiest one. Um, just bigger computers, bigger, bigger systems. Um, Although, you know, still as you go to larger and larger systems, that there in many cases it's um, it's not necessary to model explicitly atoms everywhere. And so uh, there'll be talks later about scale bridging, but some sort of more intelligent approach where you actually use atomic resolution where where it's needed, but not everywhere is is you know a better use of the that computational budget. Um, Let's see, time scales is, is much more challenging. So, you, you know, if, if instead of doing, uh, as the computers get bigger and have processes have more cores, um, more threads and GPUs, um, you want to do the same size simulation for a longer time scale, that's, that's a much more challenging problem. Um, there is, um, you know, a few cases of special purpose hardware, things like Anton, that if they're designed for particular um, potentials um, can run very fast and strong scale um, to where you can still get speed ups from running uh, just a few atoms per uh, per processor. Um, but that's a challenge, and Daniel talk a lot more about that um, in the second talk. Um, okay, so the link scale challenge. Um, this I mentioned is easy, so this will be a short segment. Um, I will mention kind of both, you know, a lot of the approaches were, were when first the first large parallel machines came out, uh, the basic approaches were developed and still used today. Um, I will describe, um, since Virginia mentioned co-design centers yesterday, uh, some that uh, is going on within ECP uh, to develop uh, per, uh, performance port portable particle frameworks. Uh, try saying that. Um, so, okay, some Popular MD codes, um, there's, you know, just an incomplete list uh, in order, and these, you know, the first few all, all emerged when the first large parallel machines came out. Um, obviously, you need some way to distribute atoms um, across the systems and take advantage of that parallelism. Um, LAMPS is really the, the elephant in the room that, you know, it's open source, everyone, uh, lots of people contributing, Aiden's off at a LAMPS uh, conference call right now. Um, but there are others, uh, several national labs, including uh, in the US and France, have their own um, parallel, ver parallel codes that are very similar to LAMPS, but more specialized for, say, a particular um, range of potentials um, and conditions. And, and just because of lab um, policies are, are generally not public, so LAMPS is the, is the go-to option. Um, I mentioned they all kind of look alike. Spasm is Los Alamos is one that was developed at the, the same time as LAMPS. And it does, they all do the same approach of, of as I mentioned, you know, for metals and coalescent materials, uh, atoms only interact with um, tens or a hundred or so of their nearest neighbors. So what's typically done is to have a potential with a finite um, cutoff radius. So that means you only need to look at atoms within that cutoff radius. Once you do that, you can decompose space into um, cells that are um, the size of that cutoff radius or smaller. And doing that, you only need to look within, for each atom within that atom cell and the immediate, immediate neighbors um, to find all of the atoms that they interact with. So that way you don't need to, um, you can if you want, but you don't need to keep a neighbor list of all the atoms that each atom interacts with uh, to compute the force. You can do that dynamically every time step. So it goes through just, you know, the time step is, is the very simple compute forces advanced particles. Um, let me see. So a little more about this. At the time, the first parallel machines, um, you know, remember this is 30 years ago, so um, memory was very expensive. Um, compute was expensive. Um, you know, thinking machines, uh, 32 megabytes um, per node. Um, so, you know, pretty small. Um, actually, at the time, communication was, was fairly cheap. Uh, communication networks were, were very good and, and had fat trees or, or three toruses. So, 
Um, it was really that, you know, memory was precious, computation was probably next. So you want to minimize, you know, repeating calculations unnecessarily or, um, or storing more information than you want. So in this case, you know, in a 2D example, 16 processors um, divided into cells the, with the dimension of that cutoff radius. Um, and every time step to find neighbors, uh, you can just proceed around a path of, to, to examine each of the neighboring cells and just, and just doing half of the neighbors for, uh, for the same reason um, uh, Vicar mentioned. Um, you don't need to do that twice. And then whenever that means that you, um, whenever the, the neighboring in space cell of atoms is on a different processor, um, that means you do a, a synchronous send and receive between, between um, all the pairs of processors. Um, so this is a very you know, fine-grained lockstep uh, parallelism, which f for the machines at the time was, was very good. Um, so, so it's this basic approach of just assigning spatial regions to nodes. And then as particles move around, they, they move from one processor to another. And you do that because then to find each time step, you can recompute this, this neighbor list. Um, there are other approaches. Um, you, know, you, you can just assign atoms to nodes. Um, uh, you can, and, and these bottom ones are some of, for some of the more strong scaling cases to reach a uh, few atoms per, per processor or rank, um, assign force terms to nodes or the so-called neutral territory method that uh, the Anton machine uses. And each of these, depending on the, the system that you want to study, the conditions, how much atoms are moving around, and the hardware that you have, um, there may be each of these in some cases optimal. Um, but the, the top right one is the one that most uh, parallel MD codes um, uh, still use. Okay, and you know, going on to a couple years ago where uh, uh, Gord Bell prizes were uh, went to uh, machine learning. In this case, this uh, the this one was for a uh, I'll say a little bit more later about machine learning potentials, but a a a deep neural network potential that uh, Princeton and collaborators developed, uh, so-called DeepMD, um, on Summit, doing millions of atoms with this potential, um, you know, reaching impressive petaflops level. There, for the past few years, has been a special Gordon Bell Prize for COVID research, and that one actually involved uh, some NAMD simulations of, uh, of the SARS virus. Again, hundreds of millions of atoms. Again, um, there was some machine learning aspect, although it was more for uh, kind of the workflow and it, the, the, you know, in principle, steering the simulations, but not actually in practice for, for these large simulations. So it's kind of, you know, t two, two simulations on Summit, each with some combination of deep and MD in their, in their title. It's, uh, um, there's obviously something there. Um, okay, so that's, where things are, I promise I mentioned a little bit about the um, uh, kind of libraries that, that ECP has developed um, for this regime and, and trying to rethink, and, and I mentioned the design constraints that led to when LAMPS and SPASM and these other, other codes were developed, trying to enable some more flexibility since architectures are, are very different these days. Um, so COPA is a co-design center for particle applications. Um, it's one of the co-design centers, obviously. Um, Cabana, uh, I think Steve Plimpton may have been the one who first suggested the, uh, the Copa Cabana name, um, but it's a, a particle library um, for um, implementing particle algorithms. Uh, and it's a library, so you can build um, a molecular dynamics code or, or other codes on top of it. Uh, but it, it you know, generally contains the particle data structures, the basic algorithms, um, things like finding neighbors and, and looping over neighbors. Um, you know, it was designed for the, the emerging exascale architectures, uh, but also to be more broadly portable. Uh, and when it was first kind of, the concept was first developed and the first prototype imp implementations were written, um, it was realized pretty quickly that a lot of what needed to be done was repeating what the Cocos library from Cyndia already did. So um, Cabana was then rewritten to be more directly dependent and, and extend Cocos directly. Um, it's open source, I'll, I'll point that out later on GitHub um, for a few years now. So the, the COPA 
the code design center is a, is a whole project. So kind of if you look at each time, the time step in a molecular dynamic simulation, so going down here, um, finding the neighbors, computing the forces, um, updating the, the positions of velocities, things like that. Um, those are pretty similar if you move, if you add in electrostatic interactions, uh, say for, for biomolecules, there, there weren't any, there aren't any biomolecular MD projects in ECP, uh, but there is, the, uh, the, there's a cosmology one that does uh, uh, gravitational end body simulations that are obviously very dependent on long range interactions. So, you know, that essentially ends in, adds in a step where you need to do, uh, by, by some, Approximation um, include these these long range effects, and then there are also other particle simulations, uh, particle and cell, and um, other methods that um, have both a particle and a mesh, um, but are still you know at their hard particle based simulations. Uh, so they had to add in a few different steps. So essentially, Cabana, the Cabana li library is trying to include all of these um, different different steps. Um, I mentioned it's built on top of Cocos, so then it's the Cocos developer, the, their problem to, you know, when a new architecture or programming model comes out to provide the performance portability and the vendors, at least the current um, Exascale vendors are very motivated to work together and, um, and make that happen. Um, Cabana then builds off, on top of that, along with some other libraries, particularly for the, the long range interactions, uh, like or you need things like FFTs um, for the, the, the meshes. There may be um, some other solvers. That you need. Um, and then on top of that, the various applications I mentioned. So th these are all you know, ECP ones, um, either, either application codes or proxies, um, as well as a, uh, s some production codes that were either retrofitted to take advantage of Cabana or written from scratch um, based on Cabana. Okay, so I mentioned kind of the key functionality that, that's needed, you know, building neighbor lists, iterating over those neighbor lists, uh, binning or sorting the atoms and, and moving them around. Um, as you, for, you know, for the finite range interactions, as you need to look at the immediate neighbors, uh, that involves a, a, what's called a halo exchange uh, between the neighboring adjacent processors. Um, so those are the kind of the the basic particle algorithms and that arise in either MD or n-body um, gravitational simulations. Um, then the other algorithms I mentioned, like uh, particle and cell, that also involve a combination of particles. They're continually mapping back and forth between particles and grids, uh, the, the, the various pro and evolving those those properties over time. Um, so those you know, introduce both some some longer range effects as well as some some. Um, um, some grid algorithms, but then are applied to things like particle and cell simulations that are common in plasma simulations. Um, MPM, which is uh, used in various fluid and solid mechanics, I'd point to uh, some of this was done in collaboration with uh, Joey Tehran, who was here for several years. Uh, and if you have you know a few minutes looking at, uh, just Google Disney snow simulation, and you can hear a, a Disney cartoon character talk about uh, the material point method uh, simulation. Um, and how that's used. Okay, so you know, getting down a little deeper into this, um, you know, some of the questions as we go to these new architectures are how do you, you know, as basic as how do you lay out your data? Um, so, you know, if you have particles that have, uh, say, a position, um, you know, x, y, and, and z, or, or x, y, and some z, and some properties, um, you can. The two obvious choices are you lay those out in memory so that. Particles are contiguous. Are, are if you want to copy a particle, you just copy a contiguous region of memory uh, with with whatever the size of that particle data is. So if you look in, in how things are in memory, it's X Y Z X Y Z. Um, the other one, if you if you are you know coming from a vector machine or a GPU approach, you think more naturally of having things laid out in arrays where you have all the X positions, all the Y positions, and and so on. Um, or often some some hybrid between those. Um, if you if you know what the the warp size is of an array, you or um, uh, or have um, vector instructions, you, you can lay out um, you know say say four x positions, four y positions, and so on, and, and block the data there. And there are trade offs between each of these. Um, things like spasm when it was written, and I mentioned um, um, you know memory is precious, and, and some of the other things. It, it, 
it became more convenient and moving atoms around all the time between processors. It became convenient to have the atoms contiguous in memory, so it's an array struct type uh, data layout. Tim, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, what, what's uh, the theme the width that you put? Oh, for, for like if you have a, um, a vector um, operations and say you can do, you know, four doubles or, or something in a single instruction. Um, you can tailor your layout so that you the data is already set up and um, aligned so that you can just feed that directly in. Um, so, so that's tied directly to the, the processor architecture, um, which obviously makes things, and that, that was one motivation for developing this library is that's something you don't want to hardwire into your code and then the new processor comes out and it has a different um, a, a different length, or, or you want to do a GPU instead of a um, uh, instead of an Intel. Okay, so I think a ni nice example of this is, is um, that, that was done with the Cabana is, is to look at um, you know in most cases you have different um, you know depending on what operation you're doing the layout the optimal layout is different. So um, if, if you're just you know particle pushes what for for pick simulations are just the, the position of velocity updates. So those you're just you know, iterating over all the, um, um, all the particles, and that's something that you know, easily vectorizes, and um, some, that's something where structure of arrays is clearly best. Um, so that's something that here, if you compare, um, on the left here is array of structures. This is the runtime. This blue bar, it's, that operation is, is you know, much, much faster if you use the structure of arrays and align all, keep all the X positions contiguous and all the Y positions. Um, other things like moving particles around or, or resorting them, um, that's something where having the, the particles data all contiguous is optimal. So those are the, the red bars here and there, that's where the array of structures is much faster than structure of arrays. Um, most molecular dynamics and most simulations involve combinations of, of different algorithms with, or steps with different, um, you know, optimal data layouts. And so, you know, if you look at the overall, in this case, just with these two steps, the overall simulation time, um, you know, the, the trade-off is that the array structures win slightly. But if you go in the middle and actually use the structure of arrays, um, that's not the optimal data layout for either of those individual steps. But for the overall combination, it is. Um, so that's something non-intuitive, and that's again depending on the machine architecture, um, the the actual system that you're simulating, and stuff like that. So that's the kind of flexibility that, that we wanted to have um, in 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 Cabana and be able to do you know this type of experiment and be able to tune that um, that parameter in, in the code um, at runtime. And I think another interesting thing is this isn't always Exactly, exactly equal to the um, that particular SIMD width of the the processor. It it, it, um, it it's very non-intuitive what what the the optimal um, solution is for you know even the the simple thing where we just have the two different kernels. Okay, so that's kind of using Cabana for a toy study. This other one is is I think a bit more surprising. Is um, uh, Princeton had a, uh, a a legacy code I actually see that, that is their workhorse for plasma physics simulations, uh, or see a particle and cell code. Um, and coming into ECP, they had three, at least three different code bases, a, a serial version, um, kind of a reference, a, a serial on node, these, these were all parallel, um, distributed parallel, it, an OpenMP version that they used for many core processors, and then a GPU, a, a CUDA version for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and you know we're maintaining those and trying to keep those three code bases aligned. Um, when Cabana came along, um, you know one of the first things was well, well maybe we can take that and see if it it you know can pr provide portability under the hood for that. So this is the time step for particle and cell simulation. So it's more complicated than MD. It involves a few steps of mapping back and forth between particles and grid, an evolving thing. Things. The, the left column here is what's being done on the CPU. The right column is what's being done on the GPU. And it, as you go down, march down over time, you see that you know, sometimes things are working together, but it's a lot of going back and forth. And part of that is the, the having to rewrite those kernels for each different um, 
either OpenMP or OpenACC or CUDA um, as things came along. Um, let's see, so when Cabana then came along, and this is just you know going over a couple of years, um, you know, they put implemented a, a few of those kernels in, in Cabana and, and started to see some acceleration. Implemented more over time and, and you know got and this is still this is a year old, so it's it's round two now. Um, you know, saw that it was there was a payoff here, and, and I think the big advantage is, is just having one code base to maintain instead of trying to, you know, they, they had to ditch their open ACC version and, and write a new one. I mean, the risk here is now they are dependent on having Cabana and Cocos going forward. Um, but it, it, you know, the payoff is huge. Um, and I'll just show this plot here. This is a scaling on um, on Summit up to what, 4,000 and some nodes. And actually, the the, um, the the Cabana version is actually faster than the hand-tuned um, CUDA, CUDA version. Um, so they didn't lose any performance. They actually gained performance um, by doing that. So you know, I think this is, if you're interested, it's 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 on GitHub. Um, they're they're a very friendly group. Uh, they're also they're active on Slack and um, I watch the flow. They're often you know a number of interesting new questions and people using it that um, I think having more people push on them is is good. So um, I'd encourage you to take a look. Okay, um, let's see. Next and. Uh, uh, just spend a little bit of time on this. Um, the accuracy challenge, um, as I mentioned, really all comes into potentials. And these are always kind of um, you know, black boxes that historically are black boxes that somebody, um, you know, if it's um, Mike Baskus for EAM and mean potentials or Adri Van Duyn for, for React FF, it's, it's somebody who you know, thinks a lot about the potentials and, and adds different um, kind of terms to, to fix up um, various issues that, that come up, and they're really an art form, uh, developing these interatomic potentials. And, and they've gotten so complicated over time that, and also with the emergence of, of, of fast machine learning algorithms, um, there's really a huge trend towards machine learning-based methods that there's still a black box, but, and, and now we give up the, uh, there's not even a person you can ask about it. It's, uh, it's the machine that's, that's done the, the development. Um, but, you know, this was a nice representation uh, of Aiden and Steve put together a few years ago uh, for the empirical potentials, you know, going up to some of these I mentioned, uh, Yam and Meme, um, the React FF and others, and, you know, essentially over time, this is an example of, of where the, the, you know, as computers got faster, um, that was being used to improve the accuracy of simulations for more complex um, materials and, and systems. So, I mean, this is a log scale. This is, um, you know, the computational time per time step. And I think we, you know, retrofitted, you know, Leonard Jones would be about here, EM is about twice as much. Um, so, you know, this is really where computational power is going towards allow, enabling more complex potentials. Um, doing direct density functional forces would be somewhere up in the ceiling. Uh, machine learning potentials are, well, you're starting to get there with GAP um, as, the, as the first of the machine learning potentials. Um, but you're still a few orders of magnitude from actually just giving up and doing ever, computing forces directly from density functional theory. Um, okay. Let's see. I So, you know, the, I'll mention the first few generations of these potentials. Um, so, you know, going from pairwise interactions like Leonard Jones, um, embedded atom method where, you know, based originally on density functional theory where, where you have a... a uh, an electron density around each atom. Actually, the original versions of, of EAM used tabular like atomic densities. Um, it was, um, you know, at some point it was realized that, you know, having a combination of a pair potential and a density-dependent term, you could just use those as, as kind of fitting functions and give up actually having physical meanings for the density, and so that's what's commonly done now. Those are all spherically symmetric um, interactions Starting to describe things like um, silicon and other materials, you need to allow for, uh, where you have more complex bonding, you need to allow for angular dependence. So within the EAM form, that's easily done by having an angularly dependent density, which then gives a mean. Um, at Livermore, John, John Moriarty and folks uh, developed a, a complementary approach, uh, uh, the MGPT, I won't go into it, it goes up to uh, kind of four-body interactions here, 
and more in different variants. And then once you go beyond simple metals and, and um, other systems, you quickly get more complicated, uh, introducing both long-range effect interactions, uh, reactions, um, allowing for bonds to form and break, um, and other properties. Um, I mentioned, you know, back in the tantalum example that, you know, in most cases, these potentials are fit to equilibrium properties. So um, it's not always guaranteed that they'll describe reaction rates um, correctly, and often they don't. So, you know, there's still, you know, in, in, in the Zeta scale era, you know, maybe just doing direct ab initio calculation of, of forces um, is likely. So I mentioned the, the machine learning potentials um, are, are very popular now. I think probably the, the first of those to come along, Borzani and, and folks, uh, the Gaussian approximation potentials, um, Aiden and his collaborators at Sandia, um, you know, developed a variant that, of that uh, called SNAP. You hear more about there, there are different variants. Essentially, in all, all of these, there, there are two key challenges or ingredients in the machine learning potentials. One is how you describe the, um, the local configuration around each atom and, and the structure of the neighbors. And then second is how, you know, having that descriptor, how you use that to develop a, um, a, a response surface to describe the potential or the, or the force that that atom, that atom feels um, due, due to that structure. And they're kind of, you know, if you go to something like Gap or Snap, it, it has a very complex descriptor and a very simple um, um, interpolation algorithm. If you go towards uh, neural network potentials, they have much simpler descriptors, but then much more complicated um, interpolation mechanisms. So there's kind of a, a interesting variety of space there. So I won't go in. I think James uh, Kermit will be here in a few weeks. Um, th there, you know, have been are there attempts to do this and kind of develop the potentials on the fly as you go along. So when you realize that you have a a local configuration you haven't seen before and, and you don't trust, you 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 stop and you do a DFT simulation or something and Recalibrate your potential. Um, this, let me see. I mentioned the um, I mentioned the Deep MD before the Princeton group and uh, and folks. This is for aluminum where they they you know trained a neural network on 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 DFT data in these shaded regions for different crystal structures, and then they got very good fits. The um, the solid curves are the machine learning potential. The dashed ones are the previous uh, EAM potential for, for aluminum. Um, at Los Alamos, let me just zip a little bit ahead. Well, let me go back. So this is essentially the same, similar to the Kermode approach where, where you, you run along and, and as, you, um, as, as you discover new configurations that you don't trust the potential for, you, um, you, you do new DFT calculations, generate new data, and um, update your potential and do this until you've kind of converged on a potential that seems to be described things. And so this is, using that approach, this is what um, their analog for aluminum, and it's you know, very similar, uh, maybe even a little better than the, the, the Princeton one, um, and it required no human intervention. It was just, um, it's just sampling random configurations and starting from that, and then running MD to see what configurations you, uh, you encounter and, and doing that for the training. So. Um, this was published a couple of years ago now. Um, um, there's work in progress to do this for more complex materials like tin, much more complicated crystal structures. Um, and this is using, um, you know, Sierra, which is a, a, similar to Summit, um, the Summit computer, using Quam Espresso for the DFT calculations, running along to generate new configurations. Uh, retraining the neural networks uh, occasionally, and then you know, converging on, on a potential that, that's pretty good for tin. Again, the, the, the lines are the, the neural net potential, the points are the DFT. Um, you know, there's some, some difference, but... Hey, Tim? Yeah. It just seems a little funny, these tests, in that if, if you're running MD, you're doing the same thing minimum primarily, and that's where they're doing their tests. But as you mentioned, a lot of your often be interested in transitions or something. I'm just wondering how general these potentials are. Um, running around minimum. That's, yeah, that's a good point. So, so a lot of these are, are um, these generally started off from the liquid, and then they're, they're running, and 
well, no, they start off even before that. They, they just generate a bunch of random configurations. Um, and, and then, then, le, then once they have the you know, initial potential from just completely random configurations, random D with that and, and sampled liquid configurations, and then kind of gradually quench down. And they're going backwards. They're working from disordered state structures towards more organized ones, whereas the normal approach to developing potentials is starting from the, the organized, the ground state crystal structures and working up. So I think that's what seemed to work here. It just seems like, you know, pretty more pointedly, if you look at this data, it's basically the energy of the minima and some harmonic modes. So it's a pretty Right, the data we're seeing is basically just the energy of the minima and the harmonic modes. Right. We'll talk later. Um, let me just, I think this kind of is what I was trying to say. Uh, so this is the, the over generation, the training, the, the, the accuracy. So you start out from the completely random and then, then slowly, you know, going from a liquid to quench it. It started to flatten out. So at that point, that's when they actually introduced uh, some, some just general crystal structures, not one specific to tin. Um, that also seemed to flatten out and, and they still quite didn't match um, the alpha tin structure. So then explicitly introducing that then, you know, gave, you know, quite good, uh, better than a competing mean potential. Um, so this is all very, um, very much an area of research. Uh, this paper was just published last week. Um, encourage you to look at that for more details. Um, and actually, the tin work still isn't uh, published or completely um, satisfactory. So wrapping up, um, let's see, I, I, I think it's, it's th these different machine learning potentials have, have generally worked better than anyone expected or has a right to expect. Um, we're all somewhat surprised. Um, they so far at least seem to be helping to address the accuracy challenge, um, especially given some problems in trying to make potentials more and more complicated. Um, at, at lake farms, um, this, this seems just as seems promising. Although, as you know, mentioned, we, we still have that hope of on zeta scale machines possibly going directly to to more accurate force calculation. Um, in the meantime, um, we have GPU platforms. Um, the X scale ones coming out are, are AMD and Intel GPU based, and so we need efficient GPU algorithms. That's one thing Danny will talk about, I believe, on Thursday. And the other one, the time scale challenge that, that I touched on a bit. Um, this is one that's a bit more system dependent and, and uh, depends on um, other things. Uh, so there are different approaches here that Daniel will talk about some of those as well on Thursday. Um, and as well as the Exalt project that he leads, um, which is trying to you know, provide a framework to, to reach all three of these uh, different challenges, the accuracy, length, and time. Uh, we're under different conditions. You, you may need one or, or more of them. Um, you know, at the time that Exalt and ECP started, it wasn't clear what the exascale architectures would be. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, the expectation was that there'd be a mini core machine uh, like the Knight's Landing. Um, Knight's Hill was going to be uh, the Aurora processor, um, as well as a GPU platform, presumably made by NVIDIA. And now we have neither um, a mini core or an NVIDIA GPU as one of the first two exascale machines. So this uncertainty was, um, you know, kind of shown back when uh, the XSCL computer was first funded in, I guess, 2021. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have expected this to be the architecture, but that, that's, that's the image that, that, that they chose. Um, and in any case, uh, just concluding the movie theme. Um, okay, thanks.